Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. As you know, problems are nothing more than inspirations for solutions, and I just received a problem. Uh, a gentleman sent me an email, and his complaint was that he was getting these very garish colored halos around stars, very, very strong color. And he wanted to know if there was something wrong with his processing. He was doing all the steps, he's a member of my site, going through all of the steps of processing. So was there a processing problem or was it something else? And in this case, I do think it is the something else. It's the kind of data that I wouldn't normally have in hand, but in this particular case, I'd like to show uh, what I think is the problem and the solution because it applies in a number of different areas. So I think it's a powerful idea. In this particular case, I believe that the reason for this particular person's problem is he, he was using a refractor. And some refractors, based on their coatings or optical design, have what I would call blue bloat, where you have, especially visible around the brightest stars, bluish stars in particular, excess scattered light at the shorter wavelengths, especially in blue. And these sensitive uh, you know, sensors that we're using, CMOS sensors and so on, they really show that effect. So the question is, is it possible to minimize it? Well, let me just show you in this quick video what I think is a possible solution. I'm going to be taking advantage of the Chromin solution of software. In this particular case, I think it's an off-label use uh, usage of Blur Exterminator. So I'll show you that. Down in the description down below, I have links to Russ Croman's software. Please check them out if you don't already have this. I don't know who does not, but if you do not, uh, check out the links, follow them from here, and you'll let Russ know that, you know, I am putting people in the right uh, direction to solve problems exactly like this. An off-label usage, but I think it could be a powerful one. So join me, and let's go check it out. So I'm going to present the problem to you in the same way that it was presented to me. I went through a couple of iterations with this person to make sure that you know we were using the correct uh, debayering pattern and some other things that could be a problem. Uh, and then I finally said, okay, well, why don't you go ahead and give me some files? So I asked for five frames of each of his calibration data as well as his uh, light frame data. So that's what I'm going to load here are his files. Here they are, and we have, everything looks very good, by the way, as far as the setup here in WBPP. We have five frames that are as light frames. We have some flat field images, darks, and biases. Because he has matching darks, the biases actually aren't being used here, but that's okay, it's loaded. I'll go ahead and turn on a cosmetic correction for the light frames so that we can do everything we can to make it look good here. And at the end of the day, we did satisfy ourselves that the pattern, the, day, the Bayer pattern is correct at RGGB, so the automatic choice here uh, for the mosaic pattern is perfectly fine to use. So that should be it. I can just go ahead and run this, give it a few moments. Of course, for you, it'll just be a few seconds, and I'll be right back for the integrated result. Okay, so WBPP has done its thing, which means I can close this, navigate to the directory that has the masters. And there should be a master light frame in here. Remember, don't confuse the local uh, normalization reference. We just want the light frame. Now, I've got two here because I did it auto crop. But I... Now, this only had five frames, so I don't expect to see a whole lot here. Although it's not bad in the sense that uh, these were five-minute exposures. So this particular gentleman did a pretty good job. Now, if we do this in the unlinked state and then we do an auto stretch, we get kind of the typical result where... Yeah, we've got this uh, insanely green thing going on. So let's just go ahead and apply a unlinked stretch. And we can see that, sure enough, this looks like this is the correct uh, debayering sense. We have a red, orange, red, whatever nebula in here. Now, it hasn't been color corrected. But you can already see kind of what the initial complaint was, where we have a pretty significant, especially around the blue stars, this kind of excess bluish light, the halo of blue around these stars. We can see that it, everything looks otherwise correct. Not all stars have 
the blue halo, just blue things. You'll notice that yellow stars, they look okay, or stars that are non-bluish anyway, they look fine. So it's really just the blue ones that seem to suffer the most. Here's, for example, a very yellowish star. So uh, why don't we just continue and do the typical thing that you would normally do. Uh, you can see that there's a gradient here. We'll just go ahead and remove the gradient using DBE, which is here. And I'm not going to do anything special here. So click on the image, put a 10 here, put a, I don't know, whatever, 20 there. And um, let's go ahead and set this up as well. We'll do subtraction, replace target image. So what I can do is just click on the image and I'll just look here at the preview and I'll just move my little cursor around until I see that there are no bright stars in the frame or even if there's one, it's okay. You know, something like that's fine. Um, and I'll just place them around various places in the frame just enough to capture what appears to be a fairly normal kind of linear gradient in this frame. There we go. That's fine. This is fine. So this is the quick and easy way to kind of select samples there. I could select one in the middle, but again, I don't think it's necessary at all. So let's be sure I've got the green going here and I've got non-green up here. This should be sufficient. So we'll go OK. There we go. Close this. Uh, if you want to see it, you can see the gradient there. Close that. Close this. Yep still keep our unlinked here and we can see the gradient has been removed great so now we'll go ahead and do color correction uh, the default here is probably what I'm going to use the uh, um, this chip will it's a one-shot color camera chip so we're going to keep the ideal QE curve we'll just re rely on the fact that all of the uh, response of the filter plus the sensor is going to be bundled into um, what we're calling here the Sony color sensor. Now I should make a region to examine here for a preview. Let's pick the region that was where there was kind of the green here. So we'll go like this. We'll drag this over here. So we add those values in. And then we'll go ahead and do it. And this will give us our color corrected version. Okay, so here's the result. A little squirrely here, but... It seems like it's giving us the right answer. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let's now link things, do an auto stretch. That looks right uh, for the amount of exposure time that we have. And you can see now really what the complaint is. We really do have some striking bluish stuff going on here. So what then could be a good solution? Well, we will try for a Chroman solution. If we go to get blur exterminator, Keep in mind that this needs to be done when the image is linear, so don't stretch your image and expect this kind of to work later on. The neural net needs to understand where the halos are, and it's going to need both uh, the star profiles and, of course, the background, the sky values, if you will, uh, the noise characteristics of the image in its linear form. So I'm going to reset this. You can see kind of what I did there, but uh, I'll reset this and say that in the beginning, my thought was, let's not even sharpen the stars at all, and we're not going to do any of the non-stellar for this kind of correction. Really, all we want to take advantage of is the adjust star halos. That's it. That's all I want to do. And that can potentially help. But, of course, we're not going to do it on the color image itself. What we need to do is create a new color image. We're going to operate on only the blue channel. So I've pressed the button up here to extract each of the color planes here, the color um, grayscale versions of the color channels. And what interests me is the image in blue here, uh, only the blue channel. So this, to be clear, this is going to mess around with the color balance of stars. But the, the system, the uh, optics already are messing around with the color balance of stars in a way with this kind of excess scattered bluish light. So I don't feel that bad about doing this, and it might be better than not doing it all. That is for you to decide, but it could be a solution. So let's go ahead and apply. Now, how much do we apply? Just so we can see the effect, I'm just going to go for the maximum amount here, and we'll just say adjust star halos. I'll go ahead and apply it to the blue plane. 
And if we zoom in, you can see what it did. Let's do a before and after. You have to keep in mind that this is now the neural net trying to identify what are halos and of a star and what's not a halo of a star. So it made an adjustment, which means we can now go back to here, channel combination, where we can reassemble everything. So that's the red, green, and blue, like that. Go ahead and reassemble, and we'll compare the two images. And you can see if it's in the right direction in terms of a, a kind of correction, a kind of a incremental improvement. I'll go ahead and get these out of the way for the moment. Let's do this, make the image the same size as the other, and then align the two together so we can do a nice quick comparison. So I'll blink the two using page down here, and hopefully you can see the difference. Let's zoom in. Now this is one of those things that, you know, whether it comes across on YouTube or not, will be something to be seen. But here's before and here's after. Can you see the difference in the blue? Certainly if you look at a star that has this excess blue that probably wasn't blue at all, you can see a little bit of that decrease in the blue. But, you know, to my eye, it might even need a little bit more oomph than even we're getting right here. So let me show you two more quick adjustments. I'll keep this one around. So this is image eight. Just keep this around for a moment. Let's go ahead and uh, separate them out again because I've closed them. And this time we'll go ahead and do a little bit of sharpening as well. And the idea here is that by sharpening the stars, again, we can reduce that. We're going to change the color balance of things a little bit. Very true. But we can go ahead and see if it helps us. One of the reasons why I claimed early in the, in the introduction that this could be a powerful thing to do is that sometimes people have, especially when they're doing monochrome imaging, they might be imaging all of their red data at some hour or perhaps on some particular night. And then later, they might be doing maybe their green or blue data, and the seeing might change in terms of the atmosphere. And you end up with fuzzier images in one channel compared to the other. You have pretty much exactly the same issue that is being shown here. Let me go ahead and reassemble. And uh, this might be a way to you know, take advantage of that otherwise difficult data by trying to moderate that effect a little bit using the halo uh, adjustment of Blur Exterminator. So here we have the image again. I'm going to go ahead and do this. Let's make it the same size. And then we will once again line them up like this, blink them, and there you go. We've taken something that I think is garish and difficult to something which looks kind of normal. Now, there is one last thing that I'll point out because I'm very, very picky about this stuff. The halo calculation that the neural net is doing extends pretty far in terms of, uh, you know, number of pixels away from stars because halos can be quite large. And as I look at this here, I can see a slight effect around uh, some of these stars, like literally uh, three or four star widths away, where the color balance of the background has changed. It became a little bit more uh, maybe green or something, green-red or something like that. So what the final kind of you know precision that you might want to do here is to create a star mask. Well, we could do that because we could extract the stars and then just make that mask um, threshold it in such a way that we're really not including any background. It's really only looking at the stars. So I'm going to go ahead and do this from the original image here. The original image, then, we're going to get out our star exterminator. And uh, we want to generate the star image. We uh, don't need to unscreen the stars. We're still in the linear sense here, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to be adding them back in. We're just using it to create kind of a mask here. Let's go ahead and just extract those stars. So here we are. I'll go ahead and uh, I can undo this just so we have this. We've got the stars here. I will be sure that there is no confusion about this. I'm going to just remove all the color information so we're left with just the uh, grayscale information here. So here's the grayscale image. If you zoom in, there may be background values here. 
So all I'm going to do is just zoom into my screen transfer function and we can black clip enough of the background. I don't need to raise this very much at all, just to be sure that these values anywhere in the areas away from the stars are truly zero. So I need to get out histogram transformation here so that I can do the final stretch. This needs to, this is a mask, so this image needs to be stretched like that. And then we can apply that image, or this mask rather, to our adjusted image. So although I've generated the mask, I think that we want this to be 100% everywhere there are stars. So we'll just use here, uh, let's just make this absolutely big blobs wherever these stars are located. Could probably just go like this, this, close this, apply this now to our blue image. This is the mask. We're going to apply it here to the blue image. Can't quite get it because the image window is not large enough. So let's go ahead and apply that mask here. Got it. Mask, show mask. You can zoom in. We'll see that some of the stars are going to be adjusted by the blur exterminator. You can see here that these backgrounds are, you know, this area here is zero, so we know that that's being totally protected. Any adjustment that's made here then should not go to that background. So now we'll just do the final comparison here. Here is the before and here's the after. Now the, we don't actually want to make them not blue. I mean, the stars are blue, but we want to take down that excess blue basically around these bluish stars. Um, and that helps actually with some of the other stars in here, makes the orange and yellow stars maybe stand out a little bit more here. Let me blink at this scale, um, which is the intrinsic scale here. This is the actual imaging scale. So here's before and after. So hopefully that's something that you'll find useful in your, if you have this kind of problem in your exploits to try to solve particular problems, not just with, um, a refractor type issue, but perhaps you have an excess fuzziness in one or the other channels, this could be something to take advantage of. Let me also just add that uh, one of the new scripts, or it's an updated version of the uh, color mask script. If it wasn't enough of an adjustment here on these blue halos, of course, you can try to identify that particular color. But in this image, it works because only those particular stars are of that particular color in the halo, but there might be other objects that actually share that same color with stars, so then you'd need to do a little bit extra work. I hope you enjoyed this and you can uh, take advantage of it. Thank you for watching. Catch you next time.